Welcome to lecture 15. We're going to start talking about a completely new topic now, namely neural networks. And I want to kick off uh, by first mentioning where in the book we are. We're going to be looking at chapters 38, 39, and 42, and there's some other chapters mentioned there which you could take a look at too. And I want to motivate why we should be interested in neural networks at all. Uh, and I'll start by talking about brains, which is one of the motivations. Uh, we don't understand how brains work, and so it's interesting to look at theoretical models of them. Um, neural networks do have engineering applications as well, and so even if you don't care about neuroscience, you might be interested in solving machine learning problems using neural net approaches. But let's uh, talk a little bit about brains. The first amazing thing about brains, which we will come to in the second lecture on neural networks, is our amazing ability to do content addressable memory. And this is quite a remarkable thing that we take for granted because we do it all the time. Let me just remind you of um, what I mean by content addressable memory. So I can give you images that are noisy and blurry and only have a small number of pixels, and maybe they make you think of things. And we get at the content, we get at the memory that you recall when you see the image by me showing you a fragment, an incomplete partial content of that memory. And that's so different from the way standard computers work. A standard computer, you know, the memory is in a drawer in the filing cabinet. To get the memory, you need to know which filing cabinet number and which card it's on, and then you go and find it there. Here we're saying, well, there's a card in there that has these holes in it, and you sort of magically out comes the card. Are you with me? Can you see what I'm on about? Let's give you just a single word um, uh, or two and another black and white image, not full color, um, something with number 049. I don't know why, but you, you sort of, you generalize a bit. And you say, oh, well, I have heard of that. I've heard of 007, and that's just 007 squared. So I give you little cues, and you actually come up with the entire memory from the cues. And that's an amazing thing that brains do. I, for me, it's really the most exciting thing about neural networks is that brains can do this, and we have some models that have a little bit of this sort of capability, which we'll come to in the next lecture. Let me give you another example. I will tell you about an Oscar-nominated actress, but I won't reveal her whole name, and she acted as senator in an, in an amazingly good George Lucas film. Um, even though one of the pieces of information that I've just given you is incorrect, Nevertheless, you are thinking of Natalie Portman, I predict. So uh, here's another example. I'm going to show you the cover of a book, and the title has several words in it, and I'm going to blank out all of the title except for two letters in the title, and I'm going to blank out almost all of the, the cover, and I'm going to put that black patch over the eyes of the author. The, the author is on, on the cover, uh, because when you put a black patch over someone's eyes, then they're very hard to recognize. But nevertheless, what's the title of the book? A brief history of time. Well done. So there it is. So that's content addressable memory. How do we do it? Can we get machines to do it? How do brains do it? For me, that's a really compelling, interesting, and exciting problem. We won't discuss that today, but it's one of the motivations for looking at neural networks. So we'll, today, we'll do some basic stuff with neural networks and maybe look at some engineering applications of them. And this is going to be the sort of pinnacle of the neural nets bit. We'll come back to this question. How can we do content addressable memory? And I'll show you a solution using neural networks. Let me give you just one more uh, motivation for being excited about brains and neural nets in general. This is based on some experiments uh, that worked as follows. The experiments were conducted in 1989. The subjects in the experiments were shown 725 images, and four of the example images are shown on the screen there. A hundred of them were labeled as positive images, and 625 of them were labeled negative images. So the subject was instructed to memorize the label, plus, plus or minus. Uh, all the images were fairly similar in character to each other. Several months later, the subjects could remember all of the positive and negative examples and could distinguish them from other images that had not been seen earlier in the experiment. And even 12 months later, they could still correctly recall all the positive and negative labels. And this is impressive to me because the subjects were pigeons. 
And pigeons can learn random binary labels, completely arbitrary binary labels associated with images. They can also learn to identify a particular person. So actually, the four images there, the two on the right, both have the same girl with the long hair and, and boots. Um, and uh, so that's how uh, some of the images worked in some of these e experiments. So whether it's random labels or meaningful labels, pigeons can learn them. And they can respond within a fraction of a second and correctly say, you know, have I seen this image before? And that ability to recognize something familiar is something that we still tr struggle to do with modern computers. So I'm going to s just spend a little bit more motivational time saying what is the difference between a pigeon and a supercomputer? So first let's just talk about the hardware difference. It, the, my, my basic case here is that pigeons thrash supercomputers. Pigeons are much better than craze at this sort of task of recognizing and responding to images extremely quickly. Um, so is it because pigeons actually have access to more hardware? Let's count. Uh, the number of devices in a pigeon brain is about 10 to the 11 neurons. The number of synapses per neuron might be 10 to the 3 or so, so maybe there's 10 to the 14 synapses, and you could think of either the neurons or the synapses as being elementary devices, a little bit like transistors. The number of devices in a cray, um, I don't know, shall we say 10 to the 10 bits of memory. Um, that's if you've got one gig of memory. Of course, they have far more. But I don't want to be unnecessarily unfair because all that memory is just sitting there being completely unused. Uh, what about in the CPU itself? The CPU maybe is, I don't know, a million or so devices in a single CPU. Uh, so you could say, ah, yeah, the pigeon is, beats the cray because it's got more devices. But the pigeon's devices are slow, so we'd better take into account the clock rate. And uh, for a cray, I'd say the clock rate is something like 1,000 megahertz, which means that um, we're in a ballpark of having 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 19 device operations per second. I just checked what the latest uh, news on supercomputers is. In, that's supercomputers with lots and lots of CPUs and tons of memory. And they can do uh, 10 to the 16 floating point operations per second. So this is two different ways of, of quantifying how much oomph you've got in a cray. So this is in terms of the, the hardware. Um, how many hardware device operations you've got per second, and then this is in terms of the output, what an entire um, supercomputer, this isn't a single uh, cray anymore, this is today's top supercomputer, super can crank out 10 to the 16 floating point operations per second. What about the pigeon? Well, the clock rate corresponds to a 10 milliseconds clock time, I'd say, roughly, because a single neuron can fire 100 times a second if you push it. Um, you could argue that some bits of the hardware maybe have a, a, a faster clock time. Maybe, you know, I, I'm an advocate of the idea that synapses can do some very rapid, interesting things, but let's just run with this number anyway. That means you've got 10 to the 13 operations per second if you take the neurons as your operating devices, or 10 to the 16 operations per second. If you view the elementary transistor-like objects as being, sorry, the synapses. So in terms of operations per second, device operations per second, the Cray has got more going for it than the, the pigeon. In terms of actual output floating operations per second, 
if you take the synapses as doing floating point operations, um, they're at the same level as a, a supercomputer in a single pigeon brain. So there's an, an amazing computational ability in a pigeon brain, but it's not actually bigger in terms of these numbers than a cray. Yes? Okay, the question is, what's the size of the words? So you're saying for these floating point operations, how oomphy is a floating point operation in a cray? So probably that's some sort of operation along the lines of a 32-bit um, integer getting multiplied by another 32-bit integer or something like that, it, and doing it absolutely perfectly. Whereas a synapse, if you're lucky, is probably doing a maybe two or four bits um, per operation, I would guess. I'd be surprised if on, on a time scale of just 10 milliseconds whether you'd be getting anything more than two or four bits because it's all dominated by Poisson noise whether channels are open or not and you've only got small integer numbers of channels. Okay? So, yes, the word sizes or the, the precision of these operations is bigger for the Cray um, or for today's supercomputer than for, for the Pigeon. They're in the same ballpark. And it's not the case that the pigeon has far more resources at its disposal. Um, maybe the pigeon is far better at this image recognizing task because it organizes its hardware differently. So, supercomputers are essentially just standard serial computers wired up in a slightly different way. They have a CPU or lots of CPUs, and um, if you want to store a new memory without losing any of your old memories in a standard computer, you have to have some new virgin hardware. So there's no connection at all between old memories and new memories. You just put them in a, another place, and you need to know where they are. Um, Meanwhile, pigeon brains have, um, they're parallel, they have high connectivity, so a typical neuron is probably connected to about a thousand other neurons, whereas a typical transistor in a Cray is probably connected uh, to roughly three or ten other transistors. Typically. And the computation, however it's being done, not that we understand it, is definitely distributed. When a uh, pigeon learns some new memory, the new memories go in the same hardware that it's using for everything else. We don't know how, but they're stored in the same hardware. And importantly, pigeon brains are robust to hardware damage. So you can take a pigeon brain, or you can take your brain, and you can damage uh, many thousands of your neurons, and you still, the following day, uh, carry on functioning. OK, you do this whenever you drink alcohol. Um, you, you kill off some neurons, but you still keep going. And the Cray, in contrast, if you reach into it and say, oh, well, I'll go and destroy 1% of the transistors in this Cray, it's going to be fine, isn't it? You find that it is not fine. So here's the hypothesis. The hypothesis is maybe the difference in the performance of the pigeon and the Cray on this sort of realistic, uh, real-world image recognition task is because of the difference in style of computation. So maybe the style of computation is the key. So maybe we should be getting away from serial if we're excited about being able to solve problems that computers are still useless at, and maybe we should be going to genuinely parallel. Maybe we should be looking at ways of using hardware that you have high connectivity, that are distributed, and work in a completely different way. So in the next lecture, we will come back to the, the task of 
storing and recalling memories, and we'll show a way of doing it with a simple neural network model. So I've just given you a 15-minute motivation for why we should be interested in parallel distributed processing, which is the name of one of the old Bibles of neural networks. And the sort of parallel distributed processing I'm going to talk about is parallel distributed processing using elementary devices that we'll call neurons. So we're going to have a single neuron, which is going to be a thing that has some inputs and an output. And then we're going to wire them up in a variety of ways. One way of wiring them up is feed forward, which looks like this. You have some inputs going in, some neurons, and then they connect to some more neurons. And we can put arrows on these edges to show which way things go. And then maybe have another neuron, and then something comes out. So that's a feed forward. Um, network. It's simple to describe because it's sort of deterministic. You just put in an input, these guys can compute, these can, can compute, these can compute, and then you're done. Another way of wiring these things up would be a feedback network where you say, let's allow everyone's outputs to be everyone else's inputs. like that. And then the dynamics depend on exactly how you define the way all the neurons uh, interact. And maybe something more exciting happens. So let's tell you a bit more about the single neuron. And then for today's lecture, I'll talk to you about feedforward networks. And the next lecture will look at feedback networks. Okay. So here's how a single neuron works. A single neuron's got inputs and an output. And it's got some parameters. And the parameters are commonly called weights. And the parameters lurk here between the inputs and the body of the neuron. <laughs> and here's how it works. It's very simple. If the weights are w1, w2, dot, 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 wk, and if the inputs are x1, x2, xk, what the neuron does is it adds up the weighted sum of its inputs using its own weights. And it adds one more number called a W0, which you can think of as a little dangling extra weight here connected to a virtual input that's always set at 1. And this weight here is also sometimes called the bias of the neuron, which is what its activation A will equal if all of the inputs are 0. Then, having computed its activation, it computes its output, also sometimes called the activity of the neuron, by shoving it through a function. And that function could be 1 over 1 plus e to the minus a, which looks like that. Or it could be hyperbolic tangent of A, which looks 
almost exactly the same. Or it could be a step function like that. And something we could note in passing is that we have come across neurons already without uh, knowing it. Um, they came up in the previous lecture when we discussed variational methods for spin systems. There we had quantities called A, which were the weighted sum of average activities of spins. So X was how much a spin was pointing up. And a was the activation, and then we slap that through a tanch to determine how much we were pointing up. So we have actually seen this in the variational free energy minimization for a spin system. We've also seen this um, a little before. One of the questions that I may have asked in the lecture, and it's certainly in the book, is if there are two Gaussian distributions and you don't know which of those a data point comes from, and it comes along in x1, x2 space, and let's say that this Gaussian is labeled class 1 and this one's labeled class 2, if I give you a data point x that came from this mixture of two Gaussians, please tell me what do you think is the probability that c equals 1? The answer to that question is f of a, um, where f is this thing, and a is indeed of precisely this form, sum of uh, wk xk plus w0. So it's exactly this form, and that's the answer to the question Uh, what's the inference of what class I'm in? And the answer is, well, there's a 50% chance that you're in class 1 if you're on this line, and a higher chance on this line, and a lower chance on this line, and so forth. So the answer to the question varies um, with contours that are linear in x1 and x2, assuming that these two Gaussians have identical covariance matrices. So I think we did that uh, exercise when we were talking about clustering earlier. So... We've already encountered neurons, we just didn't call them uh, neurons at the time. We called them simple mathematical functions, which is what they are. So let's just familiar, familiarize ourselves with the new language that we're using here. And let's have a play with one neuron. So here is a picture of the output of one neuron. And the title at the top of it, we can turn the lights down. The title tells you what the three weights of this neuron are. Why three? Well, it's because this particular neuron that we're playing with here has got two inputs. So we're going to play for a while with the feed forward network, which consists of just one neuron with two inputs, one output. And there is, as usual, a little bias hanging off here, which you can think of as being a weight W0 connected to an input that's always 1. So W1 lurks here, W2 lurks here. Right. As a function of x1 and x2, this is what the output of the neuron looks like if the weights are set to minus 15, 2, and 1 in the order bias, weight 1, and weight 2. And... The function that I'm using is the 1 over 1 plus e to the minus a, which is sometimes called the logistic function. OK, now let's play with the weights. So let's change the weights for the bias. So as we've changed the bias of the neuron, the function just trundles to and fro. The orientation of the contours doesn't change, but um, uh, the function slides around. Now let's change weight 2. What does that do? Well, it doesn't change where the function intercepts the x2 equals 0 axis, but it did 
make the function swivel around that point. Now let's change weight 1. That's going to make it swivel around the place where that red curve intersects the x1 equals 0 axis. So now you can maybe think of it at all swiveling around a point that's off the screen. This is the surface plot view. Let's redo what I just did with contour plots. Here's the contour plot for, um, let's make this look the right size. <laughs> Much better. I'm showing a contour plot of exactly the same function that we had a moment ago with the weight set to minus 15, 2, and 1. Here is the 0 0.5 contour. Here are the contours at, I forget, 0.2 and 0.8 or something like that. And the white line is a representation of the normal to the red contour. So that's, uh, and if you like, it's pointing in the direction of the weight vector. So um, this is the x1 axis still. This is the x2 axis. And I'm showing a vector that's proportional to 2 in this direction and 1 in this direction. So it's proportional to the weight vector. All right. Um, strictly, these vectors, input space, x1, x2, and weights, w1, w2, they're in uh, dual spaces to each other. So we shouldn't necessarily go plotting them on the same, same screen. But that's why I stretch the axis to make, make it look um, like it's perpendicular. Um, OK, so let's go through the three uh, weight twiddling things we just did. I'm going to twiddle weight zero, the bias. That makes the contours trundle around like this. Next, we'll weigh very W2, the third of those weights. That makes the contours wander around like this. And finally, our very weight one which will make the whole thing pivot around the place where the red line intersects the vertical axis there. All right. OK, and what I'm going to do next is vary all three of them. So I'm going to scale all the weights up or down by a factor. And I want to check that you're with me. What's going to happen if I double all three of the weights of this neuron? What's going to happen to the contour uh, plot? Chat to your neighbor. Hopefully, this is all very straightforward. OK, any prediction of what happens to the contour plot if I take all three weights and double them? Anyone? Steeper, and where does the red line go? Where does the middle contour go? Moves? Stay still? OK. Bit hard to figure out. It stays still, and it just becomes steeper. OK, so let's go back to the demo. So scaling up and down the weights doesn't change the place where the activation is 0, um, which is where the red line is. OK, so that was playing with a single neuron. Now what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about learning with a neural network consisting of just one neuron. And learning means that you get yourself some data. And the data takes the form of a set of input target pairs. So the target specifies roughly what you want the neuron to say, or the neural network to say, in response to the input. And I'll have a label called n that runs through these data. And the idea of learning is that we adjust. Learning is just a silly name for adjusting the parameters, or weights, such that the output of your neural network y, when you shove in xn, is close to tn for all n.
Obviously, when someone says, make something like that happen, what you would say to them is, well, hang on, just tell me the, the objective function, please, and then I'll minimize it. So I'll do it that way. The objective function, which measures how good the weights are, I'll call g. And to start off with, g is going to have n terms, each of which measures how close t is to y. And my measure of closeness is going to be a relative entropy. Okay, where yn is my shorthand for y when you shove in xn and have the weight set to w. Okay, so the w dependence lurks in y here and in this y. And this objective function is a sum of terms, each of which either looks like this or it looks like this, depending whether the target is 0 or the target is 1. So if y matches the target, the objective function gives you 0. And if y doesn't match the target, you get a penalty that's increasingly big the further off you are. You could think of g as being the information content of the data from the point of view of the neuron who views his output y as being the correct probability distribution for the data. Um, so it's the information content of the data, or equivalently, it is the description length of the data assuming that you view y as being the correct probability for t. Now, when I said the data, I'm being a bit imprecise. What I mean is the set of t's. So if, you, if you've already been told where the data inputs are, what the x's are, and then someone says, now I'm going to tell you the t's, this is what the description length would be if you used a perfect arithmetic coder or other compression method to encode them using this neuron. OK, so let's uh, show an example of this. So here's our single neuron, and here's some data. The sort of data we could be talking about might be we are trying to run a vegetable sorting factory uh, the pigeons have gone on strike because they've realized how good they are compared with supercomputer, and they want to be paid the same wages as supercomputers. So now we're trying to uh, get a, a simple neuron to replace the pigeon. The job of the pigeon is to sort the potatoes from the carrots or the raisins from the pebbles or whatever we're doing. And we've got some labeled data. So we've measured x1 and x2 for 10 objects. Five of them were raisins and five were pebbles. Okay, so the classes are colored there, and so we know what class each of the 10 things is in. We've got x1, we've got x2, and what I just showed you in this input space, x1, x2, is how a neuron can produce a function that is a, a ramp, um, a soft sigmoid ramp. So what is learning? Learning is minimizing an objective function like this with respect to w. So uh, what does that involve? Well, if you're at all sensible at minimizing things, you'll say, is it easy to compute the gradient? And the answer is, yes, it's easy to compute the gradient. So you get the gradient. And we'll call that g, which is dg by dw. And then you do some sensible downhill um, thing based on the gradient. The very simplest thing you could do with the gradient is called gradient descent. That's not a sensible thing to do because it doesn't um, satisfy um, the sort of covariance that you'd like, the appropriate treatment of uh, vector spaces and their duals. So this mixes up vector spaces and their, their duals, which is a crime, but lots of people do it. 
So you just work out the gradient, and then you say, let's make a step in the direction of the gradient. So that's gradient descent. And this parameter here is by neural network people called the learning rate. And that's an ad hoc parameter that you have to set somehow. It's fairly easy to um, show, and this is left as a homework exercise, that the gradient can be written as a sum over all of the uh, examples of t minus y times x. You can think of this as the error that the neuron is currently making on the nth example multiplied by the input. So to work out the gradient, you put each input in, you look at the error between the output and the target, then you multiply the error by the input to get the gradient, and you tot it up. And that simple operation, um, which we got by differentiation, is sometimes called backpropagation. So backpropagation is the neural network's community the neural network community's name for differentiation. Backpropagation is a particular algorithm for doing differentiation in feedforward networks and doing it efficiently. Okay, so what happens if we do that? We start off the neuron with some randomly chosen weights and the weights change. So here is gradient descent doing its thing, and I'm showing you the three weight values, and they uh, all blow up. What was happening in W1, W2 space looks like this. The weights wandered off in one direction, and then they wandered off in another direction. So as they went downhill, the direction of downhill changed. Uh, what was going on? Well, here's the data. Here's the initial weight vector that I, I picked at random. So it's not doing a very good job of separating the blue from the yellow. And you do gradient descent, and the weights change, and where the red line is changes, and it rotates round, and then it changes, and it rotates uh, around some more, and the weights are getting bigger and bigger. And after 40,000 iterations, that's where the weights have got to. All right, so that's learning. And you might say, well, I'm not happy. <laughs> um, Maybe I could do better than that, because a moment ago, before we got to this final optimized setting of the weights, where we've, gone, we've managed to find a place where we can put a cliff that completely separates the yellow points from the blue points, a moment before, when we were sort of halfway there, the answer looked a bit more reasonable. This, this, this is now saying, OK, you give me another example, I will classify it for you. And wherever it arrives, you'll say, I'm 99.999% sure it's a blue or uh, that it's a yellow, because we've got this incredibly steep cliff. And you might say, that, that's stupid. We don't like this outcome. Uh, it has managed to minimize the objective function, but maybe we picked the wrong objective function. So if we don't like this, what do we do? Well, sensible people change the objective function. So now what we're going to do is learning with regularization, which says, I don't like these enormous, steep, sharp changes, changes in function. Or in neural network language, we call it weight decay, because you get steep functions when the weights are big. So we add in an extra term. And the objective function gets changed. So it's not just g. The new objective function I'll call m. And that is g plus an extra term, which says, I don't like big weights. So the objective has changed from please fit the data as well as possible to please fit the data, but add on a penalty if for having big weights. So ew is going to be defined to be half sum of w k squared. All right. Right, so we do that. And now here's what happens. I've set this parameter alpha, which is either called the regularizer, if you are from the statistics world, uh, or sorry, the regularization constant. EW is called the regularizer. 
or if you're in neural networks, alpha is called the weight decay rate. When you add that on, what happens to your gradient? Well, it's just an extra term now. So the gradient of g plus alpha ew is this lot plus alpha times your weights. So going downhill on that means you've got a minus alpha w term in. And what happens when you do the minimization is shown here in terms of what the weights do. They used to blow up, but now they settle down and they don't, uh, we don't have an ever steepening function. So all the weights have settled down and here's what uh, used to happen when we didn't have the regularizer. The orange curves show everything blowing up. Here's what happens in W1, W2 space. Uh, we go downhill, downhill, and sort of stop along the trajectory effectively is what happens. Um, so we follow almost the same trajectory in weight space, but we stop um, at an optimum of this new objective function. This is where we used to be going after 40,000 iterations of steepest descents. Now when we switch on the weight decay, we go downhill and we end up in this place here. How shall I resize this again so it looks sensible? All right, and you might look at that and say, good, that's better. Um, because now it's not making completely unreasonable overconfident answers. For example, if you say, for another point arriving at this location here, um, what's the chance that this is in the blue class? It'll say, hmm, about 90%, instead of saying I'm 100% sure. Um, and if you get another one at this yellow point here, it'll say 50-50. And you might say, yeah, that's, that's not a bad answer uh, based on the data we've got here on pebbles and raisins. You might still be dissatisfied, and if you are, hold that thought. We'll come back to this in a moment. Now we're going to switch to larger networks, and then we'll come back to the, the, the single neuron when we've got some more ideas. Uh, let me just um, tell you a couple more things about the single neuron, and then we'll come back to the, this learning uh, business. Um, First, I can give you an example of using a single neuron to actually do a real problem. So I talked about pebbles and raisins. Well, here instead is a handwriting problem. You can get yourself a data set of uh, handwritten digits that have been digitized into black and white dots um, in 256 dimensions. So you can get yourself a few thousand um, examples of twos and threes and uh, use the algorithm I've just described to come up with a single neuron which has 256 inputs, it has 257 weights, and its output can be viewed as the probability that this thing I'm looking at is a two or a three. And when you do that, this is what the weights optimized look like, and the error rate of the classifier that you have made is about 10%. So on this database of handwritten digits, it gets 90% of them right, so it's not completely useless. So even a single neuron can be a, an interesting, quick and dirty way to solve some simple inference problems. A question you could ask about a single neuron is you could view it as a communication channel. So this is just a little aside and there's a whole chapter on this in the book if you're interested. One way of thinking about what's going on here is, oh, I don't really believe that the output of the neuron is the correct probability distribution. So forget that idea. But I do believe that the neuron is a helpful way to package up the contents of the data set. So <coughs> if you give me a data set with lots and lots of examples of handwritten digits, I can package all of that up into 257 little numbers, which are, say, a single neuron. And then I can send the, the neuron to someone. So I can send the weights W. And then someone else could try and reconstruct what all the labels were by I'm assuming they can get the same inputs. When they get those inputs, they can use the neuron to reconstruct <coughs> what the output was. <coughs> so this is a sort of information theory view of a single neuron. And you could ask the question, if I view the neuron as a channel, what's the capacity of that channel? How many bits can a neuron learn? <coughs> and you can formalize that question, and the chapter in the book does this. 
And there's a rather interesting non-trivial answer, which uh, comes out like this. Assuming that these x's are in random, uh, are in general position, so they're either randomly distributed or at least they're not nastily collinear with each other. If the x's are in general position, then there's a good chance that you can correctly learn with your neuron any random labeling that the world comes up with. There's a good chance you can learn that as long as the number of labels n is less than or equal to twice the number of inputs, which is twice the number of parameters. So what did I just say? I said a single neuron with k inputs can almost certainly memorize 2k random binary labels. That means that the capacity of a neuron in terms of how many bits you can store in its weights, each of the weights, w1 up to wk, each of them is a real number. But effectively, if you're using the neuron in this way as a way of just sort of learning the labels on some examples and then reproducing them, you can reliably communicate with that channel two bits per connection. So that's a really handy uh, rule of thumb for many um, neural net style applications, that if you're using a neural net, then maybe the effective number of bits you can learn in that net is something like twice the number of parameters you've got in, in the network. This is precisely true for a single neuron, and it may be true for other types of neural network as well, but you, you need to use that idea with care. Right, so that's learning as communication and the, the capacity result for a single neuron. What I want to do now is move to slightly more realistic uh, networks that are bigger. And I'm going to show you a neural network which has a load of what we call hidden neurons. And for simplicity, I'll show you a network with just one input, which is where the mouse is pointing now. This is the bias unit, if you like, and this is the output. So it's a multi-layer network with one hidden layer. You go from the input, where are we? You go from the input, which here is just one dimensional, through lots of neurons, and then you get to your output here, having gone through all of these guys here. So if h is the number of hidden neurons, the number of parameters in this thing is roughly 3h. Because there's two inputs for each one, and then this guy here has got roughly h parameters going, to here, going into him. It's probably more accurately 3h plus 1. OK, so I want to explore a bit more what functions look like for a neural network like this. This is the simplest example of a multi-layer perceptron. With one hidden layer. And these sort of multi-layer perceptrons are still quite widely uh, used. So it's uh, interesting to understand them. So let's switch to the other demo. And what I'm doing here is I'm going to show you the case h equals 3, and I'm going to make a random network. And I'm, so I'm setting all of the weights. How many are there? 6, 10. I'm setting the 10 weights of this network to random values drawn from a Gaussian distribution. And then I'll update those weights, and we'll see what happens to the, the random function. So there's a whole bunch of functions you can get. Uh, they're functions of the input variable, which is shown here. So I'm showing you the input variable x1 on the horizontal axis, and the vertical axis is the output y that's coming out of this multi-layer network. All right? So that was a little movie of a bunch of functions. What are we doing? We're just adding up three tanches. It's the sum of three hyperbolic tangents. And that's what the blue thing is. It's an example of what you get when you w make a weighted sum of three arbitrary hyperbolic tangent functions. So another name for most neural networks that are used out in the real world is weighted sums of hyperbolic tangents. But that doesn't sound quite so sexy. OK, here's one with 10 hidden neurons. And the blue line is a sum of those 10 hyperbolic tangents. The 
that all of those things that go between minus one and plus one are the hyperbolic tangent functions themselves that the 10 neurons are computing. Okay, and we randomize the weights, and it goes boodly, 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 and that shows you the sort of thing that you get for a single input, single output neural network. Let's increase to 25, and here's a whole bunch of random functions. So what does it look like? It looks like a French curve. And so another way of thinking about a neural network is these feed-forward multilayer networks are just French curves. And when you then bring along some data and say, please fit this neural network to the data, you're just saying, please put a French curve through the data. You know what I mean by a French curve? It's one of those bendy things. So you, you, you buy something that, that's uh, bendy and rubbery, and it sort of gives you a smooth curve through things. It, um, I don't know. Maybe they don't sell them anymore. But they used to be popular in, in, in high school so that you could uh, make a bendy, smooth, smooth curve. Right. So what can we do next? Um, the demo I just showed you with 25-odd hidden units, I drew the weights at random from a Gaussian distribution. I didn't tell you what the standard deviations were. Now I'm going to show you those standard deviations. They were all equal a moment ago. And this screen is now showing you for equal standard deviations for the input weights, the bias weights, and the outputs, which are colored now red, purple, and gray. The three blue curves are showing you three random draws from uh, the Gaussian distribution. All right, so you can see those three functions. And now what I'm going to do is crank up and down the standard deviations just so you can see what effect scaling the weights are about, uh, the random weights, making them bigger or smaller, has on the random functions. So first, let's crank up the input weights standard deviation. And you see the functions have got more wiggly um, and they've sort of shrunk in because we've taken all the hyperbol hyperbolic tangents and made them all steeper. Okay, if we take sigma in, the standard deviation of all the input weights down, you get much uh, broader functions that locally look just like straight lines. Okay, now let's tweak the biases. Biases, we can have big standard deviation for them. Now we've got lots of wiggles. Or we can have small standard deviation. And now we get something that looks like it's a sum of about three or four hyperbolic tangents, even though it's a, function, a sum of 25. So the standard deviation of the biases is determining how many wiggles you get. Uh, but it doesn't affect the characteristic length scale of the wiggles. That was being controlled by the standard deviation of the inputs. Finally, if we crank up and down the standard deviation of the outputs, this is trivial. The functions just become um, higher vertically or lower. All right. So that's the role of those three standard deviations. So what should we do next? Let's give ourselves some data. So just as with the single neuron, we computed the gradient and we did steepest descents on that gradient. And we ended up being able to perfectly separate the five yellow pebbles from the five blue raisins. We can do the same thing with a data set that looks like this. Here are five data points. And we can define a new objective function, which instead of being this g here is going to be a measure for real numbers of how close the outputs are to the target. So we have a neural net function like this called y. You have some target values like this. These are the errors. Here's tn. Here's yn. And we can define ed to equal sum of half tn minus yn squared. What other measure of error could you possibly have? Well, obviously, other ones. But this is a standard thing. People often sum squares. And that depends on w, on the weights through the yn's, which are all weight dependent. All right. So what do we do with that? We say, this is our objective function. Please make the output as close as possible to all the targets. You compute the gradient g, which by definition is ded by dw. And many people do steepest descents on that objective 
function. So they follow the gradient downhill. All right, lights down, please. And here's what happens after one iteration of steepest descents. I started off with a 25 hidden unit neural network shown by the blue line. And we start going downhill. And after one iteration, it's already looking quite promising. And then you do another iteration, and you do 2,000, 3,000, 8,000, 9,000 iterations. And you end up with this green thing, which perfectly goes through all five data points. And you say, hurrah, brilliant, I have learnt the function um, from the five data points. Or maybe you say, no, rubbish, that's stupid. <laughs> um, because maybe you're dealing with a noisy problem where actually what you really think is going on is that there is a true underlying function and the data points differ from it by some additive noise. And then you would be rather irritated to have a green curve that perfectly goes through every single uh, detail of the noise. And if you are dissatisfied in that way, what do you then say? Well, you say, I want to do learning with regularization. And so you change the objective function again, and you say, I need some sort of regularization. Because I don't like this wiggly function, because it's a bit wigglier than I was expecting. The expectation of it not being super duper wiggly can be expressed, perhaps, with a regularizer. And you can go back to the good old regularizer that we had a moment ago, EW. And you can add alpha times it. Or maybe you're a bit more sophisticated. And you say, actually, I should divide the weights into classes. Because remember a moment ago, the wiggliness of this typical function, it had a length scale that was determined by the standard deviation of the input weights. It had a number of wiggles that was related to the standard deviation of the biases. So it's actually the number of wiggles in a typical function was sigma bias over sigma in, um, roughly. And it had a vertical length scale that was something to do with sigma out, perhaps times square root of h. So since the input weights magnitude and the biases and the outputs are affecting things in such different ways, it might make sense to have three regularizers, one for each of these things. And you could define EW1 to be the sum of squares of the weights summing over the uh, biases. EW2 could be sum of squares of the weights over the input weights only. And EW3 could be half sum of WK squared summing over the output weights only. And that would be a more dimensionally valid thing to do. And then you can say my regularizer is sum over C goes from 1 to 3, alpha C, EWC. And then you're doing something dimensionally valid rather than just pretending that they all have the same uh, regularization constant. So when you do that, lights down, please. Um, instead of the data error going ever smaller as you manage to perfectly fit the data um, and the weights blowing up, which is what just happened with no regularizer, um, you can add on, you can set all the alphas, say, to 1, just to start off with. So alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 are all set to 1. And now you go downhill, and the first iteration looks just like last time, but you keep on going downhill, and it just sits still, and you go for 10,000 iterations, and it hasn't blown up and gone terribly wiggly to fit every detail of all the noise. Hurrah, you might say. Uh, maybe that's better. But you might still be a bit dissatisfied, because you know, is that really the answer to a question? What was the question? Um, anyway, the objective function that we are now minimizing, called m, M is equal to a multiple of ED plus sum of alpha C EW. That's what we're now minimizing. That objective function has gone down and settled down, and we found an optimum of it. And the weights haven't blown up. OK, what's next? Um, I suspect what's next is an interpretation of what we're just doing. So let's see. Yeah, OK. Let's go back to the single neuron. So the single neuron looked like that. And I want to encourage you to feel dissatisfied with this and to feel dissatisfied with 
this thing as well um, that we just had a moment ago. And then we'll fix your dissatisfaction. So why should you feel dissatisfied with this outcome of having trained a single neuron as a replacement for the pigeon that discriminates pebbles from raisins? Well, have a think about, well, one source of dissatisfaction might just be, hang on, it all depends on the value of alpha. And as you set alpha to a different value, you get a different answer. So here I've set alpha to 0.1 and you get a different solution. And here you set alpha to 1 and you get a different solution again. So one issue is, how do you set the damn regularization constant? But another issue, even if you were happy with, with some magic that was used to set it to this value, you might say, hmm, I'm willing to believe that the predictions hereabouts are quite well calibrated to this data. I think it, you know, it looks reasonable to say, yeah, yeah, sort of 20%-ish here and 80%-ish here. Yeah, that's okay. But I don't believe this extrapolation over here. So if you look at points called A and B, are you happy with the idea that we're just as confident that A is sort of 90% certain to be in the yellow class and B is also 90% certain to be in the yellow class? Is that reasonable? If you are dissatisfied, you might be interested in the view of learning as inference. So we discussed learning as communication, and now we're going to discuss learning with regularization and weight decay as inference. So if someone minimizes something, I tend to say, fine, I will exponentiate the thing you're minimizing, and I'm going to interpret it as a probability whether you like it or not. So if someone takes m of w, which is g of w plus alpha e w, and minimizes it, I will say, all right, I'm going to interpret, interpret that in the following way. The posterior probability of the weights, given the implicit assumptions you're making, is e to the minus m of w on z. And that is equal to the product of the probability of the data given w and the prior probability of w given all your assumptions. So this is your posterior distribution given the data and your other assumptions. And that needs normalizing with something. Implicitly, if you minimize this thing, you are finding the most probable w given these assumptions. The probability of the data given w is e to the g of uh, w. And the probability of w, the prior probability, is e to the minus alpha e w on something. So this is an interpretation of what people are already doing. It doesn't change anything, but it may add some useful perspectives. So if someone minimizes this objective function, they are implicitly assuming that it really is the case that there's an underlying function y that generated the data by flipping bent coins with a bias of y. So that's the interpretation of, of this. So data came from y using a bent coin of bias y. That's what this means. And the regularizer that's being used to penalize enormous weights because we decided we didn't like enormous weights is interpreted as a prior belief about the weights that says if ew is um, half w squared, for example, it's saying that the prior probability of w is a normal distribution with mean 0 and with standard deviation sigma squared w, that is equal to 1 over alpha. So this parameter alpha, which a moment, ago, a moment ago was a pain in the neck arbitrary regularization constant, is now interpreted as being the variance of a prior distribution. And this interpretation can be uh, ignored, or it can be exploited. 
the exploitation says, OK, let's take this literally, and then we can do a whole load of new things. For example, we can actually ask, what's the right way to turn the inference into a prediction? If someone asks for a prediction, what should you do? Well, if you believe this model is correct, and you're asked to predict what's the probability that the next thing that we've just observed at location x plus n, x n plus 1 is in class 1. What's the probability that this new point on the screen, at say A or B or wherever, what's the probability that it's a potato or a carrot or raisin or pebble? Given the data that we've seen so far and all the other assumptions. Well, the answer to that question isn't found by saying, please work out the W that minimizes this and then use that to make predictions. The answer is done by marginalizing. So the correct answer, if you believe all the assumptions, is you should marginalize over W, posterior probability of W given data, multiplied by the prediction, which is Y, evaluated at Xn plus 1 using the parameters W. So that's what you actually ought to do if you believe the assumptions that you've implicitly been making. That's an example of an average value of a simple function under a nasty red distribution. And we know three ways to catch that elephant. We can use Monte Carlo methods. We can use variational methods. Or we can use Laplace's method. So let's do that. So just to make clear what's red, the nasty red distribution is this thing, the posterior probability of the weights given the data. And that is this thing here. It's a nasty red thing, but we can compute it. It has the form e to the minus m of w, and m we have got a formula for. So we can attack this in a variety of ways. And the first way I will use is called Monte Carlo. So we can take our handbook of Monte Carlo methods and we can say, oh, goodness me, um, we can say hop forward five slides. <laughs> right. We can say, let's give ourselves a Monte Carlo method and use Monte Carlo to evaluate this quantity here. How different is that? Well, if we use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, do you remember Hamiltonian Monte Carlo a few lectures ago? That involved computing the gradient and then going downhill with the momentum and randomizing the momentum from time to time. A very simple version of the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo method is called the Langevin method, which involves going downhill a little bit and adding some noise. So how does that different, differ from steepest descents? It differs by adding a bit of noise. So steepest descents just goes downhill. What we're going to do now is do steepest descents with a bit of noise um, and with a, an accept-reject uh, decision in there as well. So we can use the Langevin method. And if we go back to this thing, what we will now see is the Langevin method starting from this place at the origin where we used to just go downhill, and here's where we ended up having gone downhill. We're going to use just the same amount of computer time. All we have to do is go downhill and add some noise. So it's actually not a huge cost to do this uh, fancy Bayesian inference method. You just add some noise, add the right amount of noise, put in, some, uh, put in accepts and rejects to make sure it's all uh, correct. And here's what happens. I'm going to zoom in on the first elbow of the optimization. So there's the first elbow. And during the same amount of computer time, Here's where we get to um, with the Langevin method. So it goes bumbly, bumbly, bumbly. It goes sort of generally downhill, but it's adding noise in an interesting way. Uh, pictorially, what you can think of happening is we used to go in W space, W1, W2, and it's actually three-dimensional for this toy problem. We used to go downhill to an optimum. Now we're viewing that as the minimum of a red function which has some strange shape like this. And we're going downhill and adding noise in such a way as to sample from that entire red distribution. OK, here's what happens after 40,000 iterations. We've gone bumbly, 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 and we've sampled from that entire red 
distribution. And we can take those sample points and add up the predictions y for each of those. So we can approximate this using the standard Monte Carlo idea by, this is approximately 1 over r sum r is 1 to r y of xn plus 1 using weight r, where these weights wr come from p through the miracle of Monte Carlo, through Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. All right, that's the plan. So we just need to sum up r of them. And I'll do that right now. So I'm not going to use all 40,000. I'll just pick a um, 100 or so samples. Here's what the weights were doing with time, wandering up and down um, in an autocorrelated way. Uh, that's what they would have done if we just optimized. They would have settled down and stayed still. So we're doing something more interesting, bobbling around, looking at plausible outcomes. And this is what it looks like if we take those 100 samples, and I'll now visualize some of them for you in input space. So I'm going to show you 30 of those functions, 30 of these functions, y of xn for the 30 different values of w. So I'm going to show you the x dependence now. All right? And the concept is these are 30 typical plausible ideas about how to explain the data. Off we go. Here's one of them. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And as we run through these, notice that the classification of B sometimes changes. Look, it's on the blue side now. It's still on the blue side. Now it's on the yellow side. And the classification of A doesn't change so much. It's on the yellow side, yellow, uh, just a little bit of blue, yellow, 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 yellow. So when we add all of these together, you can anticipate that the answer for A is not going to be the same as the answer for B anymore. Whereas when we approximated this integral here in a really stupid way by saying, let's approximate this as the integral dw delta function at w set to w star times y of x w. That's a really stupid approximation that says let's replace the whole distribution by a, a spike at the optimum. When we did that, A got the same answer as B. So now let's do it right. And when you do it right, given the assumptions we've just made, you get not this, which is the answer with the optimized parameters, but this. And you might say, I prefer that, in which case you might like viewing learning as inference. OK, so that was uh, one method. Another method is to say, hmm, I don't want to do Monte Carlo. I want to use something a bit more deterministic. So you could say, I'm going to approximate this by integral dw, a nice distribution, q of w given data, or rather given theta, times y. So you could say, I can't cope with this Monte Carlo integration approach, but if q had some simple form, for example, a normal distribution, then maybe I could com compute this fairly uh, quickly and simply. So the approach that I'll show you now says, let's use Laplace's method to come up with a normal approximation, and then we'll plop it into that formula and do the last step numerically, which can be done very easily. So lights down again. Um, just show you these a few more times because you get a nice sort of um, illusion of non parallelness <laughs> OK, um, this, here's a few more Langevin pictures before we, we do Laplace. Um, this shows, in contrast to the objective function that went down when we minimized it, under the Langevin method, it goes down and all over the place because we're not asking the optimizer to optimize it anymore. We didn't actually want to optimize it because we, yeah, we're not interested in the best parameters. We're actually interested in what plausible settings of the parameters are. OK. Um, so what's next? Laplace's method. 
Here is the Gaussian approximation. It, it's as a function of W1, W2, and W3, which you can't see, uh, the three weights. Or, um, and it's a Gaussian distribution that I've projected down onto this W1, W2 space for this particular figure here. And when you uh, integrate out the weights and then compute the numerical integral that you're left with, um, you can notice that the Gaussian approximation isn't necessarily a very good one, incidentally, because that's the yellow samples from the posterior with the Langevin method, and that doesn't look at all like samples from the green Gaussian. So it's not a very good approximation, but nevertheless, it's better than not bothering at all. Um, and here was the predictions with the optimized parameters. Here's the predictions we got from the Langevin method, and here's what you get from the Gaussian approximation. So it's got the same sort of banana -y shape, but uh, in numerical detail, it's um, a bit different. Okay, I think that's the end of the learning as inference for the single neuron. We can now go through the same process for uh, the feed-forward network as well. So let's go back to this. Okay. So, a moment ago, we were, I hope, dissatisfied because the green line went perfectly through all the red points, which is what we had asked it to do. And now we're going to say, all right, we don't like that. Let's use the Langevin method to sample from the posterior. So we give exactly the same interpretation. The two terms, the data term and the weight terms, are the likelihood on log scale and the prior of a Bayesian uh, distribution. And we use the Langevin method in just the same way. So instead of computing the gradient and going downhill, you compute the gradient, go downhill, and add some noise. And that means that the first few steps look just the same as before, but now you go boobly bubbly, bibbly bubbly, bibbly bubbly, bibbly bubbly, instead of just settling down and going to a boring optimum. And you can pick from uh, those 30,000 iterations a few representative samples. For example, a dozen is probably enough for many problems, and those dozen samples can be used to predict things like what's your mean, what's your variance, and so forth. So I can extract from these 12 samples, which show 12 credible hypotheses of what the underlying function is, assuming that it was made by a sum of hyperbolic tangents. Um, that's 12 hypotheses, and here is the mean and standard deviation that you get from those 12 samples. Notice the standard deviation is small where you've got data. It's small over here, and it gets wider when you start extrapolating, and it's also wider when you... Uh, interpolating over here. So that's uh, again showing the benefit of using a um, Bayesian view of this sort of learning process. And there are many other uh, benefits that I won't go into now. For example, you can get automatic complexity control. The values of alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 become increasingly important the more dimensions you're, you're working in. Um, and you can use Bayesian methods to automatically infer what should alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 be given the data that I've got? So you can get rid of that headache as well with the Bayesian approach. Right, is there any more in that? Uh, here's a graph showing what happened to the objective function, and that is that. Okay, so I've shown you the interpretation of learning as inference, and I want to wrap up now by just telling you a few applications of these sort of feed-forward neural network methods. So these are all quite old now because I wrote the slides a while ago and they were uh, some interesting examples at the time and there are more that have come in um, in the intervening years. The very earliest application um, that I came across of using feedforward neural networks to solve interesting problems was the task of uh, getting a, a neural network to read aloud, in quotes. The way that worked was the input represented seven successive letters in a piece of text. The hidden units got to see all seven letters, do some nonlinear stuff, and spit out an output, which was not just one number, but rather a multidimensional representation of a phoneme. So there was a binary encoding of the input and a binary encoding of phonemes. And the training algorithm said, OK, let's take a load of text and correct pronunciations and see um, if we can learn and generalize. So that was a, an early success of, of neural networks, because it didn't work too badly. Um, another very significant success, uh, which I think still has not really um, been significantly beaten, 
is the use of multilayer uh, feed forward neural networks to do genuine handwriting recognition. This was done by Jan LeCun and colleagues at AT&T. Um, and here's an example of um, an input to the network, which is a three and a four with some scribbles on it. And it's got zillions of hidden units. And then the output pops out at the top and it says there's a three and a four. And it's a very impressive thing. I, I was meaning to get in my browser a, a web page showing you um, a demonstration of this thing. You can, you can hunt for it, hunt for Lunet on the internet and uh, see the range of things that it could correctly um, classify. Another example that I was involved in was the modeling of weld toughness. Um, weld toughness is a function of cookery, essentially. You cook the weld by putting in various um, impurities and picking annealing temperatures and so forth, and out pops a weld with a whole range of properties. It has a toughness, it has a strength, uh, yield, uh, yield strength, and ultimate tensile strength, and so forth. And if you're going to use a weld in a particular component, for example, these things on the floor are power station components and they need to be welded together, uh, you want the weld to have correct um, properties. And there are many ways of trying to model weld uh, properties like toughness, but if it's a really complicated thing, and toughness is, maybe it's a good idea just to get data and train a neural network on it. And, and that's what Harry Bredicia and I did. And uh, this uh, is a real photo of boxes of welding um, stuff. This is a photo of the real thing that was made with the help of the neural network. These components are about to be welded together with the stuff that was designed using the neural network. And here's the man whose job it is to do the welding. He's just having a practice before he actually welds the, the real components. So this is used for real at, at Siemens. And it's uh, estimated that the neural net approach um, sa saved significant resources of um, compared with the alternative, which would be to make a weld, test it, and then make another weld and test it and keep on changing the, the cookery by, by hand. Uh, so that's uh, a success, and we've written uh, probably two dozen papers on modeling various properties of welds and other types of metal. Um, another example that I got um, excited about at the time was a nature paper by Roger Angel which described how you could focus multiple mirror telescopes using neural networks. The input to the neural network was uh, the slightly fuzzy, slightly out of focus image coming from um, the, the multiple mirror telescope and the output is the action that you should apply right now to your telescope to, to clean up um, the, the, the fuzziness and non-focusedness of, of the multiple mirror image. It's a, a very uh, ill-posed um, and tricky problem to solve by other methods, but neural networks were able to do a grand job. Um, so we've talked through the probabilistic interpretation of learning, and you might say, oh, so all these neural networks, it's just high dimensional curve fitting, isn't it? And that is exactly correct for the ones I've just been telling you about. These multilayer perceptron uh, networks that our feed forward networks really are just doing high dimensional curve fitting. And if it's expedient to use a neural network, fine. But if you have other methods of doing high dimensional curve fitting that you are content with and that don't get on your nerves, then you could use those uh, as well. And a concrete example of another way of doing high dimensional curve fitting is Gaussian processes, which are described in the book. So you don't have to use neural networks. You could just use a Gaussian process, which is a high dimensional curve fitting model. Does the brain only do high dimensional curve fitting? Well, I suspect the answer is no. We don't know how brains work, but I do think that brains are more exciting things. Here's a thing your brain can do. I don't know if you've seen this picture before. It's a picture of an animal. Um, and it, can you see what it is? Hands up if you can recognize it. OK, so it's a dog, and it's facing that way. And it's, it's sort of facing away from us. It's a Dalmatian. and. That's its ear. Can everyone see it now? Hands up. Can see it? OK. So I, I, I find it hard to imagine that this is just a feed-forward uh, multidimensional curve-fitting exercise. And when I look at an image like this, I find it sort of exciting, and it feels like my brain is coming up with hypotheses and is an active uh, participant, um, maybe coming up with explanations for the world and so forth. So I think brains aren't just feed-forward neural networks, and there's anatomical evidence that they aren't just feed-forward uh, neural networks as well. So in the next lecture, we'll come back to 
for me, one of the most exciting questions, which is how can we make content addressable memories? And I'll describe a very simple neural network that can solve a content addressable memory challenge. Here is the challenge. The challenge is to make a dynamical system. It should be a system with 25 degrees of freedom, 25 variables that change with time. The dynamical system can have 300 tunable parameters, and those parameters have four bits of precision. The challenge is you are going to be given some desired memories, and those memories should be fixed points of the dynamics. So the memories might look like this. Here are three 25-dimensional patterns. They look like a D, a J, and a C. And you've got to come up with a way of instantly saying, OK, I will set the 300 parameters in the following way, and I will now have fixed points at those, so that if you set off from a noisy version of one of those desired memories, like this, which is actually a noisy D, the dynamics of your dynamical system should take you to this, which is a cleaned up D. If I give you this, it's a noisy C, you should end up with this. And if I give you this, which is a noisy J, you should end up with this. That's the challenge, to come up with a way of making a dynamical system and setting its parameters so that for any choice, or almost any choice, of the fixed points, you can set the parameters and create those fixed points so that it will do content addressable memory. It'll do cleaning up of a noisy memory. Moreover, your dynamical system should have the following properties. It should be possible, if I give you an extra memory, and I say, oh, here's a fourth one I just thought of, you should be able to make just a little tweak to the parameters so that the three memories that were already there are still there. Just like I tell you something new and you don't forget everything that you've already learned. The old memories should be preserved, but you should learn the new memory too. You should have a new fixed point. So just a little tweak to the parameters should magically create a new fixed point. And I want it to be able to drink alcohol and still work. So your dynamical system should be robust to corrupting more than half of the parameters and it should still work and still have fixed points at those three places. Okay, that's the challenge, and I encourage you to try and solve this challenge before the next lecture, and in the next lecture, I'll show you a solution to this problem. Thanks for listening.